What is feminist philosophy? Why has the world of ideas been historically dominated by male thinkers? Is the discrimination faced by female intellectuals in the past still with us in the present? These are the questions I'm trying to answer on the 51st episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 51st episode of Patterson in Pursuit. We're talking today about a topic I know virtually nothing about, but I'm interested in learning. That is feminist philosophy. You might think to yourself, what is feminist philosophy? And don't worry, you're not alone. That is the first question I ask my guest this week, Dr. Michelle Bulas Walker, who teaches at the University of Queensland. So when trying to learn any discipline or any subject or any skill, there is a phenomena called beginner's mind. And it is an ideal state for you to put your mind in. Imagine that you're trying to undertake a project that you know absolutely nothing about. And you want to try to learn the very basic concepts, the fundamentals about that particular subject. You would ask really elementary questions. And those happen to be the most important questions. Far too many people start talking about advanced subjects before they establish the basics. So that's the mindset I'm trying to approach the topic of feminist philosophy with. I don't really know anything about it, and I'm excited that I don't. Dr. Velas Walker teaches on this subject, and she's written a book called Philosophy and the Maternal Body, which I'll have a link to on this week's show notes page, steve-patterson.com slash 51. Before we start, I want to give my deepest thanks to all of the Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. We're over 80 now, and we're building a little community of rationalists who are seeking the truth, perhaps in a slightly unconventional way. Your guys' support makes this show possible. And for most of my life, I have been radically independent in pursuing these things on my own. But to have a group of people that are listening and valuing this content and value Patterson in Pursuit, it just means the world to me. So do stay engaged with the show. Shoot me an email, leave comments on YouTube. If you want to help out, leave a rating and review on iTunes, or you can also become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. All right, I hope you enjoy my interview trying to get down to the basics of feminist philosophy. First of all, I want to thank you for sitting down and talking with me today. You're welcome. I've got a bunch of elementary questions for you. In the history of philosophy, it's dominated by male thinkers. Throughout history, virtually all of them are male thinkers. And the question arises, why is that the case? And we can theorize about all different potential explanations, but it's a really unique fact that in terms of when we look back over history, who the thinkers are that everybody looks up to, that everybody gets taught, it's all men, practically. So I want to start with two questions. First of all, what does the term feminist philosophy mean? And then the next question would be, what is your explanation, your perspective for that fact of history, that it's so biased towards men? Okay, well, there's a huge amount in both of those questions, (laughs) really a huge amount. Let me start with the first, and that is a provisional definition of of feminist philosophy. Um, That's really tricky because it's so different depending on who's practicing. But let me give you a, a provisional or a tentative definition, and let's see where we can go from there. And one is that if we look at the terms, say, feminist, women and philosophy, uh, the feminist bit there is doing the specific work of saying when you are a woman and you're doing philosophy or when you're doing anything in a social context, it always matters that you're a woman. There's, there's something attached to that. Feminism is the term or the approach or the, the understanding that helps us to make sense of why it matters and how it matters. So feminist philosophy, taking that as a starting point, feminist philosophy would be something along the lines of a kind of methodology or an approach to asking questions about what it means for women to be, in this specific case, involved in 
in the institutional discourses mm -hmm. of philosophy. So let me ask you right off the get-go a follow-up question about that. When you say that it is an essential part of doing philosophy as a woman is that you are a woman. Now is that because of the social pressures or the social way of thinking about women doing philosophy or are you saying that an inherent part of being a woman is that your take on philosophy is going to be a little bit different, or is it both? It possibly hovers between the two, but it's not about, um, the, there is no essential question here, for me at least. It is, it is more about the social construction here of it's going to matter socially and culturally, it's going to matter in terms of authority or lack of authority that, that you're a woman mm -hmm. doing this work. And so rather than try and sweep that under the carpet and just go ahead and do philosophy as if one's in a sense literally disembodied the feminist element helps us ask questions about what is going on when it be, when it is or why it is an issue mm -hmm. that being a woman and doing philosophy is a big deal mm -hmm. it shouldn't be a big deal so when you say it's a big deal does, are you saying is this an institutional criticism from about um the philosophy profession, or are you saying this is a more, an even broader critique of society in general? It's both. both. <laughs> <laughs> as, you, as you'd imagine, it's both. Because at the institutional level, we know statistically that there are definitely fewer of us, of women, doing, um, being paid, let's say, as professional philosophers. Uh, but that fits within a social context that um, assumes that the philosopher is al already a, a male or a male body or a masculine body and is confused when confronted with mm. the, this notion of um, a woman occupying this very privileged position. Reason and rationality and philosophy occupy, well, for most people, maybe not too much space at all. <laughs> <laughs> but in the kind of cultural imaginary of the West, they, off, they are very elite and mm -hmm. specialized um, roles or positions. And for women to gain access to those spaces has, has been somewhat of a, an event. So then does that answer the second part of the question then that when you, when you look at the history of philosophy, has it been essentially the same story you know, for thousands of years? And that is at least a partial explanation for why there are so few historical female philosophers is because of this kind of cultural um, atmosphere. Well, it's, there's two sides to this, I guess. And one is that in the West, we're looking at the work, the philosophical work that comes from the pre-Socratics, so before Plato's time and from Plato's time on. So we're looking roughly around 500 BC on, which is a long period of time. Now, in that time, we don't come up with too many names of women philosophers, but we do, but there are women philosophers mm -hmm. from these times. So on the one hand, yes, it's true that women have been somewhat marginalized, often downrightly excluded, like the 18th century particularly, we'd talk a, about a period of time where women are, are physically barred mm. from the practice of philosophy. But throughout that entire history of philosophy, uh, women, women do exist, and one of the important things to point to is, is where they do exist and when they do exist to point out who they are um, and to learn as much as we can about mm -hmm. the work that exists. So on the one hand, feminist philosophers are involved in recuperative work, finding that work that does exist. It's, it's not easy to do, obviously, um, but championing it once um, mm -hmm. once that work is found and discussed. And there are some very, very high profile and classic cases and, and names there. And the work of those women philosophers who haven't been mainstream but who have existed is just fabulous work. So on the one hand, I would want to say, look, women have always done philosophy. Uh, and we even know that in certain senses from Plato's dialogues. There's the the really the the beautiful dialogue that that Plato's constructed, the Symposium. One of the key characters who's admittedly not present in that dialogue, but is is Socrates speaks on her behalf, is Diotima, the wise woman, and and some of the work that she uh, does in that particular context is the foundation of very interesting approach to philosophy. So those voices exist, and we want to claim those voices. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, 
women have been sadly num lacking in number and and you know effectively we we have been marginalized and, mm -hmm. and in many instances excluded and silenced and that's a problem so can you give just a few examples where you said there are there are some notable figures who have done really interesting work can you let's say from yeah from the pre-socratics can you give a, a few from the pre-socratics it's much harder to do mm -hmm. much harder to do but if we jump way ahead uh, well what i'm claiming is that we've got figures or characters in some of the platonic works that mm -hmm. we can point to diotima being one of them uh, although you know her role is very contested um, in the in the um, discussions. But if we jump way ahead, we've got people like Emily du Châtelet, uh, we've got people like Sophie Vallon, we've got people, um, women like Elizabeth of Bohemia, who were absolutely crucial uh, correspondents with the, the well-known philosophers of their mm. time. Perhaps around the time of the Enlightenment, the, we start to see both the names appearing and also disappearing as well of, of women philosophers. But for example, someone like Elizabeth um, is a imp really important correspondent with René Descartes. Now we know Descartes' work really very well on, on the whole. Those that, that have read philosophy tend to know Descartes' work. Few people know Elizabeth's work, and yet it's Elizabeth's letters and continual inquiring and and pushing of Descartes that moves him further in mm. his own work, uh, but in her in her letters to him, there is a really rich and elaborated philosophical position there. And so it's often what we'll find is that the philosophical work of women exists in places like correspondence or letters mm -hmm. because that was you know the, their only avenue. That was how they were not published, but but gained some kind of. Um, context for philosophical dialogue now with that with that correspondence with Descartes do you know what the the topic was was it some of his mathematical work some of the his strict philosophic work absolutely his philosophical work and so the the her letters in response really um, respond very strongly to the meditations mm -hmm. and the meditations are for many of us they're the crucial and, and central works for Descartes so there Descartes setting up a kind of skeptical position about what's possible for him to know and not know and and it's it's Elizabeth who in a sense um, really refines and pushes and and prompts uh, through her responses to him about his work. I like that too. Um, so often on, on the podcast, I'll bring up my wife, Julia, and she by far has heard, she has been a consistent correspondent, first line correspondent constantly for the work that I'm doing and trying to create theories about philosophy. And so she's, she definitely would qualify as <laughs> uh, a philosopher in her own right. And what's funny is um, I remember for years, there's this particular idea in metaphysics about um, the nature of objects. Do ordinary objects exist, or is it just constructed by their constituent particles and we label them as objects? I remember I had this, I came to the conclusion, totally uh, changed my previous position, that ordinary objects as we think of them don't really exist, it's just the base level constituent parts, and then we label them as particular objects. And I told her that, and she was like, yeah, of course. <laughs> is this is this is this news? And I thought, what isn't this amazing? She's like, no, I I, th I thought everybody thought that way. So she's got in her mind the way that she thinks about things. I bump into that occasionally, where it's like she's already sorted out these things well ahead of time, and I feel kind of silly because it's like I think something is this profound conclusion. She's like, oh, I already got that sorted out. <laughs> There's a lot to say about that, and one obvious thing is is the supportive role that women often play in relation to the men in their lives. Um, but in this sense, I think both of us are talking more about a provocative role mm -hmm. um, and a, a role that pushes and, and questions. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, it's quite often historically been the case that the men have gained all the notoriety for what's come right. out of that. But again, it goes back very specifically to that Plato's dialogue that I mentioned before to um, the symposium because in the symposium, what Socrates does, what Plato has Socrates do, is that 
um, to put it in context, um, Socrates stands up, uh, all of the others at the, the symposium, the drinking party that they're, they're attending, have given speeches in praise of love. Socrates gets up finally to give not a speech in praise of love, but to tell the truth about love, being the good philosopher that he is. And he, interestingly, he does so by saying, well, everything I'm about to tell you, I've learned from the wise woman Diotima. And, and then basically proceeds to give this account. So interestingly, at the beginning, at the birth of a certain moment of Western philosophy, it's, we have Plato, Socrates, providing us with the words of a, a woman of wisdom that found this notion of, of philosophy and the philosopher's journey and the importance of passionate love and erotic love in that journey. And when I think about that, trying to come up with a theory and applying it to history and some is t sometimes dubious. But when I think about like my relationship with my wife, um, you know, I mean, there's even the, the, the popular saying, you know, behind every great man is a great woman. Do you think this is a partial explanation maybe for why the men get the credit is because often there is that more supportive role that the women play and then the men I don't want to say they take credit for it as if it's like a, a as like it's a nefarious thing, but it's something like they they're the the outs, like the marketing piece for the idea. Some of the beliefs I have about the importance of love, I only came to these conclusions precisely because of engagements that I've had with her, and she's taught me a great deal. But do you think that's a, a dubious way to, to to think maybe this is what has happened throughout history? It's complex. You've actually, I think asked a lot of things there and raised a lot of things. It's complex. What I think is that the idea of a man and a woman, two people, being able to explore and express and, and motivate each other to think more carefully about issues, whether they be love or reason or rationality or whatever, um, that this is a marvelous thing. I think this is a fabulous thing. Mm -hmm. But that's occurred historically within the context of, let us just loosely refer to it as a, a patriarchal social context. Now that's changed from time to time and that's changed from place to place. Patriarchy doesn't exist in the same form in, in all, under all circumstances. But what I mean by that is that structurally what happens is that it, what might even occur within the context of a really supportive relationship between two people then is contextualized within a social context that says the man is usually paid for that work and gets the social recognition in the public sphere, whereas the woman's contribution to that becomes the silent foundation hmm. of, of the identity that that man then, then builds and develops through his public career. So that makes sense. Why? So a couple of questions. Why do you think that's the case, that there is this, um, the male, I think that's a good way of putting it, the male gets paid for it or is seen as like the uh, part of his career, and then the, the woman most frequently not as much. Why is that the case, if that's kind of a social thing? So that's the first question. Go ahead. Can we go straight to yeah. that then? Well, very simply, at one level, it's because structurally, at various times, women are literally excluded from the public domain. So they, they cannot or have not obtained work, paid work, um, at, in this case, as philosophers. So it's the, economically, ideologically, culturally, there are ways of excluding women from the public domain. So in one sense, one of the important things that we need to talk about is the fact that you've got these various oppositions in Western culture, not only in Western culture, but specifically for us. And, and they vary over time and place too, but you've, let's say we've got man and woman, we've got men and women, we've got masculinity and femininity, but we've also got the public and the private. And the public domain, historically, this is what patriarchy, how we can define patriarchy in one sense, if you like, the public domain is the domain that, that men have a privileged access to. Men go back and gain sustenance and support in the private domain, in and through the family, in and through the wife, the partner, in and through the mother, importantly. 
um, but they then, once sustained and nourished, they go back out into the public domain to be um, social subjects or citizens or whatever they become. And historically, women have had limited access to that public domain. So it's not surprising that women have had limited access to careers in philosophy or to identities as philosophers. Well, that's exactly the second question that I wanted to ask you about the patriarchy. When we apply that lens historically, I think that's pretty clear, especially if you read some of the writing of various philosophers on their thoughts about women. It's pretty explicitly uh, that they're not fit for this particular domain. So do you think that that is still the standard Western culture today? Because when I, when I would have these conversations with people and when I interact with the world, at least, I mean, I've only been around for a couple of decades, but it doesn't seem like it has that same um, explicit exclusion from the workplace. So that's the first question. Do you think that the, that type of deliberate exclusion from the workplace is still going on today? And if not, where did things start changing? Okay, well, there's, there's ways of thinking about this. And one is that you have periods where women are literally excluded from the public domain or the workplace or, or the institutional practice of philosophy. And that's obviously problematic. Um, but there are, we can say now that, that in certain Western countries, in certain parts of the Western world, women now have that access. Mm. That access, though, is still mediated because that access depends on available finances, and we know that women are financially less, um, less well off than men. We know statistically that's the case. So there are, all, there are still prohibitions or, or mediations that make it difficult mm. for women to access, in, the, say, the institutional study. But even when women do access the institutional study or even a career in philosophy, there are still dangers and pitfalls. And some of those uh, go along the lines of what kind of philosophy do you do once you're there? Mm -hmm. So it's not just enough to, to study philosophy or to become a philosopher, but do you then get a chance to, in a sense, think independently, write independently, or do you, enact, which, which historically has also been the case for some women who've gained that privileged access, they've become faithful, faithful, um, um, faithful kind of disciples of male philosophers mm. and have worked, often these philosophers are long dead, but they've often become faithful commentators on the work of these philosophers in an attempt to make sure that the, the work of that particular philosopher lives on, while not in a sense promoting their own work mm -hmm. or their own independent thought. That's what I'm, I'm not saying that happens all the time, it doesn't, <laughs> not by any means, but historically, as women have made partial gains into the public domain, um, it hasn't always been the case that just accessing the public domain has been enough for women mm. to actually become philosophers in their own right. So how would you respond to somebody that says the, the key part is that women have the access um, kind of structurally and culturally, that people aren't ex explicitly saying, you know, you can't have this career as a woman. That's, that is important, and let's say that that's been achieved in the West, that there's not, there's not you know, a gender requirement for being a philosopher. How would you respond to somebody saying the discrepancy that we see in the, the different um, areas of research from biology to philosophy to social sciences and economics, those gender differences are based on the choices of women. So if somebody said women in general aren't usually as interested in original contributions to philosophy as men, how would you respond to that? I obviously, I disagree. <laughs> but I'd, I'd look again to the structural, the structural um, conditions that that support or or don't support women in educational possibilities. And I'd say I don't think it's ever the case that women are not interested in those things. But I would say that again, structurally, young girls and young women are often dissuaded in a range of complex ways from having an interest in those things. Mm. And I think that's a different thing. Can you give some examples of, of that, like where they would start? And Well, it, that's complex, Stephen. I think, again, that comes back to really basic ideas. 
all the really basic oppositions that still throb in the heart of the Western cultural imaginary. And that is something along the lines of we still have this division, this oppositional division between reason or rationality on the one hand and irrationality. Mm. We still have this division between reason and emotion. We still think prim primarily in terms of body and or mind and body. And the problem is that particularly with the, that dichotomy or that opposition between reason and irrationality, it is still it has, has historically been and is still in the contemporary day used to ground the difference between men and women mm. and masculinity and femininity in really often subtle ways, sometimes not so subtle too, but whether from advertising to, um, you know, to scientific discourses and um, the, the presumptions that go behind certain scientific methodologies or philosophical methodologies, we still can find plenty of evidence of this separation of reason and, and uh, irrationality okay. alighting with um, masculinity and femininity. So in something like, you said there are the presuppositions in, in our approaches to um, scientific inquiry. My intuition is to think, of course I'm open to being wrong here, my intuition is to think that some division between rational and irrational, not on gender lines, but some division between those spheres is correct. That there is something like rational thinking about something and there is irrational thinking about something. Are you saying that that division itself is is a mistaken division, or are you saying that when it's tied to gender, that's when that's a mistake? I think it's a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. I think um, that we all intuitively feel comfortable with the sense that there, there are reasonable statements and there are irrational statements, mm -hmm. or there are reasonable worlds and irrational worlds, particularly in the modern time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is that overlay. It's the really seri um, the series of very complex interconnections between reason and rationality and masculinity and scientific notions of proof and evidence and whatever. It's it's the interconnections that separate femininity and the feminine and woman and and passionate um, spheres from those realms. That that to me is the the most obvious problem. So. Are you saying that the way that, that kind of the standard approach to science, the reason, evidence, logic, data gathering, very linear approach, are you saying that that is itself something which is masculine or that is, are you saying that that is socially considered as being the masculine yeah. approach to how we... Definitely the latter. I, d yeah. it, I don't see it as masculine yeah. uh, and I certainly don't see it as male, but I do see it as a tradition that many men have been engaged in. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of these things more in terms of a kind of cultural imaginary that we have this, this kind of set of beliefs about reality which we don't question very readily uh, about how we divide the world, how we understand the world, and our, our beliefs about masculinity and femininity are structured by this imaginary, not by reality, but mm. by this imaginary. So this is operating at a not yet conscious level, really. Um, and, and that's important that um, that then just does so much work in determining or structuring the possibilities of little boys and little girls and and various groups, um, you know, from an early stage on. So if I were to try to rephrase that, correct me if I'm wrong, is your claim that even the way that most people conceive of the nature of the world, of reality, is already structured? in maybe an incorrect fashion, that even the way that we approach thinking about the world already contains some kind of a, an elimination of possibilities. What I'd say is that it's mediated, mm. and that for us reality is connected with a set of fantasies as well. And I don't mean that that's absolutely terrible and possible. That's just the way I think things operate. We have a kind of fantastic view of reality, in a sense. And in that, we separate these notions of masculinity and femininity out all too strongly. And that's because the overlying structure, or let's call it really the underlying structure, is still a patriarchal one. If our society were not patriarchal, the imaginary 
wouldn't separate masculinity out into the superior categories of rationality and femininity out into the inferior yeah. categories of irrationality. But just to go back a step too, you mentioned before, or you asked whether or not I saw that as a, a, a fair distinction or not, um, rationality and irrationality. I guess intuitively, you know, I do. But at the same time, I acknowledge, along with a, a lot of other philosophers, that rationality and irrationality are not, it's not a fixed relation and it's not a fixed opposition. It's absolutely historically constructed. It changes, it varies, it, it, it modifies, and that that's important. Mm -hmm. um, we have, in the West, we have dominant ways of, of thinking about those terms, rationality mm -hmm. and irrationality. But the claims of rationality largely produce the question of what is irrational. <laughs> so irrationality doesn't exist in its own right. It is the kind of, pro it's produced through the imaginary of, of rationality, if you like, if that makes sense. So, uh, yes. Um, so you're kind of saying w once you accept a certain framework, then we get to the category of what is considered irrational when, the, when you're in that framework. You, you use the term the fantastical and imaginary for, for talking about how, descriptions of reality. Can you unpack that a little bit more for me? So are you saying that we really don't have any kind of reasonable connection or, or reliable connection to the nature of the world? And we're, and we're kind of making things up because when I think of those words, that's just what comes to mind. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. It's just like storytelling that may or may not correspond to anything. It's not as it's not as um, extreme as it seems. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that we are out of touch with reality. I just think realistically that reality is produced. You know, in in the sense that we overlay from the experiences and the events of our lives, we overlay uh, a whole realm of cultural knowledge or cultural history or, or the, what I was referring to before as the imaginary. And that filter, we filter our reality through those, those beliefs and values that we have inherited largely. Um, so no, I'm not trying to pretend that you know reality is is that we are totally out of touch with reality. Intuitively, we have a sense of what's happening around us, but our relation with everything that happens around us is also mediated at a, a somewhat not quite conscious level um, by by unacknowledged assumptions, beliefs, and prejudices. A lot of what we've been talking about comes back to the question of philosophy, not just as an institution, although that's, that's really important, but philosophy as a discipline. And a lot of what we've been talking about is, is kind of, maybe it's a little clearer when we think about what it is that philosophy as a discipline is or what it does. Disciplines on, on the whole are mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion. So philosophy sets itself up in the West as a discipline at specific times and places. And in doing that, it excludes whole worlds outside of itself mm -hmm. and says that's not philosophy. And to a large extent, philosophy, philosophy starts by, by its definition or its disciplinary nature is to say philosophy is not what's irrational or philosophy is not what's feminine, hmm. or philosophy is not what's literary, or any number of other things. And so its definition often starts in a negative sense. And then reason, rationality, um, careful consideration, ideas like this, are often then seen as counters to what's irrational. Hmm. So one of the things that I'm trying to suggest here is that masculinity and femininity get mapped onto that complex process and that in philosophy, the, the whole notion of discipline is to include and exclude. And in that sense, masculinity and femininity get caught up in that inclusion and exclusion. And mm. on the whole, in the West, masculinity gets included inside all of the positive terms and values, whether they be reason or rationality or whatever they are. And femininity gets constructed outside of that disciplinary boundary. So on one level, we can just simply say that masculinity is a kind of inside to philosophy and femininity is a kind of mm -hmm. outside. So of course that explains 
historically why women have been excluded from philosophy on the whole. But the, the situation is so much more complex because by setting up a, an excluded zone outside of the discipline of philosophy, philosophy actually has brought the feminine into its core because it needs the notion of the feminine to define itself against. So it's central to philosophy, even though it's kind of silenced in that center. So the, the normal spatial logics that we'd think about in terms of inside and out, women and men inside, women out, fe masculine inside, masculine out, a feminine out, these don't operate really so in that direction. They are so much more complex and philosophy has, is inhabited by what it's trying to expel. So if we set up those parameters and we say, okay, masculine on the inside, by definition, we're going to say that means the other stuff on the outside, which would be caught up and that would be femininity. Nature's out there too. We should never forget nature and a whole host of other things. So, so can you give me some specifics for claims that are... So if, if, if I were to say something like philosophy can be understood as pursuing the true nature of the way things are in the world... That's the kind of really abstract way of, of thinking about it. Can you give me an example of where that would exclude like the feminine part of that, the femininity in that conception? The, the, your description is philosophy is the... Philosophy is the pursuit of the truth, truth. The truth. And or trying to explain the, all the phenomena that we experience in some kind of coherent way. Well, at a basic level, I mean, some of the feminist epistemologists would respond to that by saying whose truth um, and whose, whose particular journey, uh, you know, whose, which journey is this that we're specifically talking about? How do we proceed? What, what are our methodologies? Mm -hmm. and, and who's limiting the question of truth here? So maybe to put it more simply, Steve, is to say at any given time, who the philosopher that is undertaking that particular pursuit, the, the daily, the real bodily experiences and, and context of that philosopher matter. The fact of who that philosopher is, what that philosopher is, where that philosopher is, or when that philosopher is, hmm. that matters. And hmm. so the question of truth then is contextualized a little more than, than uh, eternalized. So are you saying that it is a mistaken way to conceive of philosophy as thinking you can separate the ideas from the person pursuing the ideas? That you have all this other context that's kind of inescapable about the, maybe the, the individual you know, truth seeker's background or education, their socioeconomic status, all of the, there's this very rich history that really can't be separated from the ideas of that particular thinker? I'm not sure I'd say mistaken, but I would certainly say that, that the embedded and embodied nature of the philosopher is, is, a, is a question and an important one. And probably that's one of, I mean, one can't generalize about feminist philosophy because it's, there are so many approaches to feminist philosophy. But maybe that is one thing that we can say is that the, the, the question of embodiment has become a really important part for many femi feminist philosophers. The question of the, the actual materiality of, of our ways of knowing. So yeah, that, that's important. So when you ask the question, um, whose truth, that comes, that question is also a statement about a, uh, the nature of truth, what we mean by the term truth. When, when you ask the question, or when a, when a feminist epistemologist would ask that question, is the claim that the nature of truth is itself kind of um, unique to the individual pursuing it, or is the claim that there is no such thing as this what we think of as this objective truth out there that everybody is everybody has access to does that is that itself a kind of claim about the nature of truth there are so many different perspectives on this honestly <laughs> and it's not it's not for me to actually um, answer that question but what i would do is to say 
go and look at the myriad different approaches fe to feminist epistemology that have emerged in the last you know couple of decades it's amazing what's out there and each of those approaches will give you a slightly different okay. response um, as I mean, it's not dissimilar to the fact that epistemology generally will give you those kinds of incredibly mm -hmm. varied responses. Feminist epistemology is, is similar in that sense, that it, there's, uh, there's such an array of different possible responses there. So one question that we didn't talk a lot about, but I really want to know, I want to go into more detail with you, is if somebody were to say that distinctions we see in the pursuit of different fields, not just in terms of um, academic pursuits, but also career pursuits. We see, you know, a very large amount percentage-wise of, you know, startup founders or men, let's say. In my observations of the world, I do see differences on average, there are certainly exceptions, between the behavior of your stereotypical man, the behavior of your stereotypical woman, where I would say it seems like the individual choices on net that are being made by women seem to be less um, risky isn't the right word, risky in an economic sense. So the, that, the, to, to be the founder of a startup, seems to be itself a more masculine decision or something like that. So do you think that those kind of traits that we see really are purely as a, as a function of social constructions and kind of cultural conditioning or do you think that there is a genuine difference between the choices that women make on their own free will or the, and the choices that men make well again you've asked a lot of questions <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> really all together it's complex but one would answer please enough. yeah <laughs> um number one i guess i've got I've got to think about the word choices there mm -hmm. because for me choices, I mean we can get caught in a very liberal individualist kind of um, way of thinking there and I want to resist that in some senses that choices don't occur um, in, in any free context. Um, choices occur within a context that already I've been referring to here as, as patriarchal in that sense. So if we talk about, if we try and put these two things side by side, men's choices and women's choices, mm -hmm. already we have this intuition that the way men choose and the way women choose is maybe not equal. And that goes into a whole range of different experiences and educational possibilities and limitations that may or may not have occurred within those contexts. So it does come back to the sense that if you've got a culture that is reinforcing in subtle and not so subtle ways time and time again that men are active and defiant and and risk-taking mm -hmm. and women are risk averse and um, more passive and and more relational then it won't be very surprising to find that that may or may not be the case mm -hmm. if we go and do some empirical evidence out in in the, the world of startups but to me, that doesn't confirm a difference between masculinity and femininity. It, it suggests more that masculinity and femininity are still linked to these defining kind of oppositional terms or couples in the Western imaginary, male-female, rationality, irrationality, active-passive mm -hmm. in this account. I mean, that's a really important one, active, activity and passivity. Mm -hmm. Is, is prime against a, a way, you know, way of, of thinking through how we can understand the difference between man and woman or masculinity and femininity. So in a hypothetical scenario, if you were to interview, let's say, 50 different women, and most of them say, I'm not really interested in philosophy, or I'm not really interested in doing a startup, they might report, they might say, it's my own free decision to make. But would you say they're even in the way that they're conceiving of their choices, it's already going to be, it's already going to be kind of framed for them? I, to some extent, yes, but I think that's absolutely true for young men as well, mm -hmm. because, you know, young men will see themselves as, as, as more actively pursuing, more risk-taking, more challenging projects. Um, so it's something that occurs on both levels, I think. So in a society where you didn't have that, let's just idealize a society, do you think that we would see a 
equal distribution of career choices and life choices between the sexes? Well, part of what feminism is, is, a, is to think utopian, in a utopian manner. And yes, we can all think toward this notion where, yes, all of those things would be possible. But then we're talking about a society that would uncouple those conceptual connections. So you would uncouple masculinity from rationality, from activity, from um, risk, risk taking, and you would uncouple femininity from passivity, from irrationality, or, or whatever sets of um, oppositions you want to talk about. That's no easy task, obviously, um, but, but it's an important task, and that's partially the work of feminism. And that's why, and this is often, an, I think, a really misunderstood um, aspect of feminist work, whether it be in philosophy or elsewhere. My understanding of feminism, my personal understanding of feminism, is that it's a political intervention, a critical intervention into the possibilities of the lives of both women and men, into the lives of girls and boys. Because if we free uh, the, the possibility of, um, if we free and open possibilities for girls and for women, I think we do that equally for, for boys and men as well. So there's, there are, I mean, we can talk about all of the advantages that accrue for men by being associated with masculinity and rationality, but there are disadvantages as well. Mm. Um, and, and feminism is about saying, let us, in, a se in this sense, actually try and think reasonably about humanity um, as, as, as options that are open. So... Okay, maybe a, maybe a better way for me to ask this. So we, kind of the starting point is there are biological differences. You, so we would agree that there are biological differences. That's complex. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are obviously differences. Right. But biology never occurs outside of culture. So the way that we determine what, bio, what those biological differences are, the, the, that way, is is always going to be mediated again by mm. the social context. So yes, of course, there are bodily differences, mm -hmm. but what those bodily differences are can be absolutely um, discussed. Okay, so let's say there are bodily differences, and let's not quite get to the cultural implications of what, where those bodily differences manifest and how we describe them, but there are bodily differences. Do you think that also applies to the mind and the way that the, those um, bodily differences give rise to different physical traits that we have, do you think it would also give rise just naturally, starting with the, the bodily differences, to different ways of thinking? <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me backtrack. Let me backtrack and say that there are bodily differences, but biology and body and difference take on different values, are valued differently in different contexts. And so the values of those differences are, are not stable and not fixed. So the way that we absolutely appreciate and understand those differences is complex. It's really complex. And we really don't give enough credit to how complex that is. Mm -hmm. I actually do think there are differences, of course, uh, between bodies. Um, and those are now complex differences because the question of masculine feminine or male female is not the only range that we have to consider. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think there are differences and I do think those differences give rise to different experiences mm -hmm. um, with some obvious examples um, on both sides. Uh, but but the, the way that we come to understand or appreciate what that means is complex and it's still occurring within a context that values masculinity and mm. devalues femininity. So if we were to take the line of reasoning that said there are bodily differences that are manifested as somebody gets older and we have you know, what we, what we call men and what we call women in a biological sense, you're going to see you know, men 
in general have careers doing manual labor for bodily differences. You're going to see more lumberjacks, let's say, that have those bodily differences. That to me would ex would largely explain some career choices. The literal, you know, the, the big beefy guy is going to have a more successful career doing big beefy things and somebody skinny and wimpy like me is, is going to be, is not going to have a successful career doing uh, difficult things. Um, so that, that I could see the career discrepancy there. But our, if we follow that line of reasoning, would we say, well, some of those bodily differences are also mind differences and would naturally result in differences of choices. So like with women, for example, there's a dominance of women in like caretaking industries. Now, is that because this is something that is that women are more disposed to do for those bodily differences, or is it that those are uh, those emerge from our kind of cultural categorizations of how those people with the bodily differences should act? So, if somebody were to take the position that you know, in in an, in a ideal society where you still have bodily differences, you would have a substantive striation of uh, people with these bodily differences do these career choices, these people with the other bodily differences have those other career choices. How would you respond to that? If I said even in an ideal world we'd see something like that. Oh, there's always going to be difference and, mm -hmm. and, and division of labor, of course. But I d guess I don't agree with your line of thinking so much. What I would say, and certainly if you, we go back to your example of the the worker in um, childcare, or was that the example that you gave? Yeah, so there, were, there was two. The one was the, the lumberjack mm. versus me. I would be a terrible lumberjack. And then the childcare, which seems to be a more what yeah. we consider to be the feminine caring. Okay, kind of what I think about childcare is that it's, well, I'm going to approach this from a really different way. Mm -hmm. I want to say first that I think childcare is one of the most important things that we could or should be doing in our society. Uh, it's the basis of so much. But because it has been historically associated with women and women's work and defined as women's work, it has no cultural value or it has very little cultural value, unfortunately. It's very poorly paid, at least in this country, it's very extremely poorly paid poorly remunerated, and that goes along with its low status. Now all of this isn't because of the work that's done. It's very hard, it's very demanding, and it's very important work. But it goes along with the fact that by being considered the epitome of women's work, it's not really seen as work at mm. all. And that that makes it possible for us to refuse to remunerate that work at a level that it should be remunerated at. And, and the fact that um, it is seen as, as non-professional work uh, and that it has very low cultural um, status, these things are all important. So it's that, to me, mm. that makes more sense of what's going on. Men are not going to be attracted to, to work um, of that status. I mean, I don't know the situation of lumberjacks. It's really outside of my <laughs> field of expertise. But I imagine that one of the things that may occur in the case of the lumberjack is that in exchange for extremely physical and possibly um, dangerous work, that there would be fairly good compensation. That's, that's a realm that's so often the not, not open to women. Interesting. So when you are viewing compensation for work, you're viewing it as this relationship with how a culture values that work being done. So if there's a low, you know, like the childcare work is very low played, you say that is directly correlated to how a culture values that work. See, my, my intuition is to view it more just in terms of economics or supply and demand or something like that. I would say, well, there's a, there's a huge amount of labor that's available for child care and so naturally we would have relatively low wages in that area just because there's so much supply that's available and versus something like being a lumberjack there's a lot fewer people that want to be lumberjacks and so we would have the comp amount of compensation go up how would you respond to something like that well i'd have to resist from saying something like that it's delightfully 
naive, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> because I guess from my own perspective, I just think there's so much more over determining those what counts as work in the first place. Mm. And I think one of the problems with the question or the example of childcare is that it is not actually seen as work at all. And, and thus, and yet it has to occur. And so how do we deal with it? We deal with it by totally undervaluing it, devaluing it and underpaying it. So when you, I, I, it's so funny, I'm, I'm very biased in this. Um, I can see even in the way that I'm approaching these questions, but when you say that it's not seen as work. Why do you say that? If it's the case that people are getting some kind of compensation, why would we say, well, it's not seen as work? I think it comes back to what I was saying before or suggesting before about the division, again, in Western societies. It operates differently everywhere between the public and the private. Mm. I think childcare is this confusing state that is actually now occurring in the public domain but it's seen in terms of its, you know, being the relic of the, the private domain. Um, women are working now, and thus childcare, paid childcare is needed. And yet it's a confusion of public and private. This is really a problem for the, the kind of the dominant imaginary, or the, we might even think of it as the capitalist imaginary here. No, I think capitalism has no problems with it. It can just extract surplus labor and, and it's done with it. I don't think that's a problem. But in the masculine or the patriarchal way that our society orients itself, this is work that really still should be happening unpaid and unseen in the private sphere. Hmm. And so it is not valued and it is not well paid. It confounds, uh, having childcare in the public domain confounds the purity of the public sphere and the private sphere. And we're not supposed to confound those two things. So uh, surely this is not the only circumstance. You would say there are other areas in which there is this um, of two minds. You have the, the public sphere and the private sphere. Can you give some other examples of where this would be the case? Oh, the very obvious case is elderly care. Mm. Exactly the same mentality operating, the sense that this is traditionally women's unpaid work mm. and it should be occurring in the private domain. What on earth is it doing in the public domain? Okay, we have to do it, then let's devalue it and let's underpay it. Do you think that that is a kind of a conscious thing? Do, people, do you think people are consciously thinking that or this is just all kind of behind the scenes and subconscious? No, no, I don't think it's un I don't think it's conscious and I don't think it's um, subconscious. I think it's not yet conscious or not quite conscious. Mm. Um, these are the what I'm trying to suggest is that philosophy operates here in a more important way than we give it credit for. These these conceptual divisions between the public and the private, these matter and yet they're not things that we tend to talk about in a conscious way mm -hmm. at work over the, over the photocopier. Um, you know, we don't tend to think of, well, how's your public and private you know, going today, Steve? Are you managing to mingle or not? Um, but I think, so, so in the West we, we make these divisions. We have these conceptual oppositions that are hierarchically organized. We have the public up here and the private here. And the public is the domain of masculinity traditionally, and the private is the domain of femininity traditionally. And so they, these impact in really significant ways in situations like work, in situations, in many other situations, in educational situations mm -hmm. as well too. If you think about education, there's another um, similarity there. The younger the, the younger the educator, or sorry, the younger the 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 level of education to the higher the salary and the status goes up. So you start at the at kindergarten, what we would call kindergarten or or prep here, with low status and low salary. And by university, if you're teaching and educating at that level, you have more status and more mm -hmm. salary. Not terrific, but you know <laughs> <laughs> but more. And again I think that's this sense that that as the child gets older, the child moves from the private to the public domain, and so that process of education becomes more validated. So when you think of that kind of compensation for educational work, you're putting it in the context of how society in general values it. It's not as much supply and demand, it's not, you know, it requires more training or anything like that. It's, it, this is 
is this kind of like a manifestation almost of the uh, cultural values? Is that yeah, the way that... yeah okay. I certainly would see it in those terms. Supply and demand will come into it, but they will operate in complex ways on top of this division between public and private. So last question. This has been an excellent conversation. Can you unpack the metaphysics of that, of that claim that there are it's not a subconscious belief, it's not a conscious belief, it's a not yet conscious belief. If we're going to say, try to say precisely what is it or where is it, yeah, what is it? <laughs> so uh, when, we, when we say that the society is kind of a manifestation of some of these cultural values prior to their manifestation, and where, do they, where are they located where, in like this public conscious, how does that work? Okay, complex, complex. <laughs> Let me try and respond to that. At one level, it comes back to what I've referred to before as a, a cultural imaginary, which sometimes manifests as a masculine imaginary. So it's this, this very amorphous set of beliefs and values that, that exist at the not yet conscious level, but that are shared um, by, in a dominant social form or a dominant cultural form. So maybe that's one way of thinking about it. But the other way of thinking about it comes right back to the fundamental metaphysical distinction between mind and body. And we tend to think of understanding and ideas and beliefs and whatever occurring at the purely conscious level of mind. What I would take from the phenomenological traditions um, is something more along the line of an embodied consciousness. So that's a complex way of saying or responding to your question, where does all of this kind of exist? Where mm -hmm. does it lie? I think when things are not yet conscious, that's when we know that what we're, we're dealing with is an embodied consciousness. So it's not that our mind has all of the conscious contents and that our bodies know nothing of that. Mm. Uh, if we follow a philosopher like someone like, say, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, his notion of embodied consciousness makes sense because it's it's consciousness that, in fact, we the the body subject carries with it or, or develops or or has, um, and that that's that can become conscious that knowledge or that that belief or that idea can become conscious, mm. but it also remains at a level not yet conscious. And that that's, it's p impacting on us without us consciously being aware of it. Now, is that, are those not yet conscious beliefs, are those in every individual's mind and they're not yet conscious of it? Or is there some kind of a broader, uh, like a union, like meta-conscious? <laughs> I'm just trying to think. If... You're starting to sound like Jung. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm trying to think of if... If it's the case that there are these, what you could call beliefs or values that we're not aware of, we're not yet aware of, does that mean that there's some kind of an imprint of them in every individual's mind, then they could become aware of them? Or is it that it's, it's bigger than that? Well, again, complex question. Maybe the only way I can respond to that is to say, these things that are not yet conscious, I actually see philosophy's role as being precisely to actually plummet these things or to try and to access these things. The, the role of critical thought is to take the not yet conscious and as much as possible make it conscious. Mm -hmm. So we might even talk about that as un, you know, unexamined uh, assumptions or whatever, but, but something along those lines. Now, feminism here sits beautifully within the context of philosophy for me because it's doing the same thing. It's doing the work of taking, taking that not yet conscious and trying to make it conscious. So in this context, what feminism is doing is taking the not yet conscious of the masculine imaginary and of patriarchy and trying to bring it to consciousness in a way that will benefit men and women alike. But prior to its, prior to its reaching that level of consciousness, where is it? It is embodied. It is embodied in each individual? Well, I guess it's embodied in each individual insofar as, as yes, we are part of larger 
social and cultural collectives that share these imaginaries or they share this imaginary. So would you say then that the kind of the metaphysical analysis of it is that there is some kind of a larger collective mind for maybe that's lack of a better term or unconscious belief system that actually has some kind of existence to it that each individual mind is illuminating or is it that it's in everybody's individual mind that gets I wouldn't call it mind at all okay. I would simply call it oh golly to use a 60s term ideology okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know yes we share there's there's a shared ideology or better still set of ideologies that interact in complex ways and yes we partake of those ideologies i mean the french uh, philosopher louis althusser had a good way of of making a kind of distinction between the ideological state apparatus and the repressive state apparatus that each culture has its repressive obvious ways of making us toe the line but it has its more subtle ideological ways of helping us toe the line mm. by internalizing the values of that dominant ideology or, or culture. Well, that's an excellent note to end on. I appreciate this conversation. It's been great. Thank you. Really enjoyable. All right. That was my interview with Dr. Michelle Velas walker I hope you enjoyed it and found it insightful. I certainly did. Lots more to say on this particular topic. It's obviously a huge area. We just scratched the surface. So the journey continues for me and my wife. Two days from now, we are leaving and we are heading on a plane to Japan. So you can expect a few more interviews that I recorded here in Australia. And then we're going to talk about Shintoism, Buddhism, hopefully Islam, consciousness, and Eastern philosophy. So we'll see you then. Have a great week.